So it's not the right or wrong. And if you took the wrong amount of uh, objectives and you take the channel out, that will not be achieved. Will not be achieved. And you put channel in, and will not be achieved. So the difference between having the number of poor people in the world by 2015 is one thing. Okay? Called China and the reforms observed. So that will be enough for both sides. I'll say the other ones. Second, uh, cliche, uh, also true, even though I often stated, no bilateral relationship in the world will be more important in the next century, the next quarter century, the next 50 years, than China and the United States. Third, a less recognized point especially among the children classes, that's folks like us, is that because there's no precedent for such a rapid rise of a state of China's proportions, the dark space of honor for controversy, exaggeration, and continued claims is closer to the realm of a strategy or fortune telling than it is to what we would think of as science or even social science. So you get a lot of extreme claims, not from the authors we're going to hear from today. And finally, to come to me more today, even less well recognized, my fourth point, is that if you ask the question, which university in the world is best positioned to play a role in a new meeting for the for the leadership of both China and the U.S., the challenges these developments will pose for both countries, there can be only one answer. And we're so it. So, thanks to people like Ezra and Tony, we have a front row seat uh, and a good window into the most significant geopolitical development in the world today, and today, the exploration of the individual who is running the engine for that economic transformation. So let me turn to Ezra. Soviet dispute, and in 1963, after a series of nine letters, 
uh, exchange between the countries. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was selected to go to the Soviet Union to carry on the final debate with Sislaw. Uh, here he is at the airport. And if you look at Deng, uh, he was five feet tall. Some people say he was only four feet 11. Uh, <coughs> he was it was five feet tall. Uh, but he doesn't look like he has any inferiority complex. Uh, here he is uh, off, off to uh, Moscow uh, at the Beijing airport. Uh, <coughs> when uh, Deng uh, be uh, was beginning to return after his uh, second uh, big time he was thrown out by Mao, uh, he wanted to open up the outside world. One of the main things he wanted to do was science. And here he is with a couple of Nobel Prize scientists in 1957, just on the eve of coming to power. When he came to power in December 78, he felt that the two most important countries that could help the Chinese development were Japan and the United States. He took a trip to Japan, and here he is with the emperor. Uh, the first time in the 2,500 years of contact between China and Japan, that the Chinese leader had met the emperor. Uh, and uh, Dunn also took the uh, opportunity to visit the factories to get a sense of what modernity was like. Uh, and here he is uh, at the Kimitsu steel plant, which became the model uh, for Baoshan, the first great modern steel plant in China. Uh, here he is in uh, South uh, East Asia uh, visiting Mingguanyu. Uh, Mingguanyu, uh, 18 years younger, uh, had uh, studied in English schools more than Chinese, but had a very good understanding of Deng and said that Deng uh, was the greatest leader he ever met. Uh, I think Deng was quite pleased that he could meet Mingguanyu uh, because uh, Li Guan Yu, after all, was uh, ethnic Chinese. And all those people who said that China could not have modernization, Chinese civilization was not fitted, were already proven wrong uh, in Singapore, where Li Guan Yu and the ethnic Chinese were leading modernization. And that was a great encouragement uh, for them. Uh, Deng uh, tried to uh, adapt uh, to uh, Li Guan Yu. Uh, Li Guan Yu uh, had a special uh, 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 ducked and in, introduced so that dung smoke, the smoke could be carried out. Uh, he also had a brand new spittoon for dung, uh, but dung uh, honoring Lee Guan Yu did not spit or smoke during the visit. <coughs> uh, and uh, here we have uh, 1978, the spring, the beginning of a uh, time when the real talks of normalization uh, between the United States and China began with Zbigniew Brzezinski. Uh, although Nixon had visited in 72, we didn't get around to normalization. A lot of issues were left. And Zbig, uh, who uh, shared with Deng uh, contempt for the Soviet Union, uh, found each other uh, very good partners. And Zbig came back saying he, he's very smart, bright, quick, uh, enjoyed working from the very beginning. And they worked together to have normalization. Uh, and then the talks for normalization were conducted uh, mostly by diplomats, but the last few talks were between the uh, ambassador-ranked uh, Woodcock uh, from the CIO, uh, AFL formerly, and now uh, head of the liaison office in Beijing, uh, and Deng. Um, and uh, here we have uh, President Carter uh, meeting uh, Deng in Washington after normalization was complete, and Ji Chao Ju, who attended Harvard as an undergraduate from 1948 to 50, uh, as interpreter until he went back for the Korean War. <clears throat> um, and uh, here we have a meeting uh, in the Congress. Uh, Deng, uh, you can see sort of in the middle, to his right, uh, to, to your left is the interpreter, and to his left is a white-haired old guy, Tip O'Neill. Uh, and uh, Tip O'Neill, the House Majority Leader, uh, explained to Deng uh, how uh, the uh, Congress fought with the White House, uh, and Deng was just absolutely enchanted, invited Tip to come to China, and Tip accepted. But at the end of the conversation, after, uh, after O'Neill explained how the two branches fought with each other, uh, Deng said it wouldn't work in China. <laughs> this is the famous uh, picture of uh, Deng when given the cowboy hat. Uh, there's no question that Deng uh, was uh, quite responsive. Uh, and was concerned about making a good impression with America. 
But Orville Schell, who, who was a journalist who attended that and wrote about this event, said when that event was shown in China, it also meant that all those horrible things about imperialists were now waved aside and people could begin imbibing American uh, culture, science, technology, and ways of thinking. Um, and uh, here we have uh, uh, Reagan met a number of, uh, Deng met uh, all the major leaders, uh, and after he met Reagan, uh, that was Reagan's comment. Uh, he didn't seem like a communist. Uh, here he is uh, speaking with Margaret Thatcher, and you notice at the bottom the spittoon which uh, adorned uh, Deng's uh, uh, meeting room when he met with foreign visitors, and people said when he was emphatic and making points, uh, he used it uh, a great deal. Uh, here he is uh, welcoming McNamara when he wanted to join the United Nations with a splatoon also uh, readily available. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, the World Bank, and uh, what Zelik is going to talk about tomorrow night. And Dung wanted to join uh, the World uh, Bank very quickly uh, and take part in international relations. Uh, and uh, here he is meeting uh, George Bush Sr who just happened in 1975 to be in Beijing as head of the liaison office when Deng was in power at the beckon of Mao. And so they became very close friends and their relationship played a role in keeping the two countries working together after Tiananmen. Uh, here he is in the spring of 1989, uh, patching up the Soviet re uh, relation with the Soviet Union that he had helped split uh, in 1963. Uh, and uh, Gorbachev is coming on Deng's condition that they pull out of Afghanistan and, and pull troops away from, uh, from Mongolia, uh, and also that Vietnam uh, pull out of Cambodia. Uh, and uh, here we have Deng saying goodbye at the end of his career uh, to 1992 and pointing out his successor, uh, Jiang Zemin. Thank you very much for the slideshow. Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think I've taken quite a bit of my time already, so maybe if I can try to five minutes uh, to, uh, to uh, point out what I think is the critical thing in 1978 when Deng came to power after uh, he had been uh, succeeded uh, Mao, and who, who left in 1976. At that time, uh, China had an average per capita income of less than $100. Uh, the country was, an a it was in a state of internal Civil war as a result of the Cultural Revolution when some people uh, were fighting against other people. There was not enough grain uh, to feed the population. They had to import grain. Uh, they had uh, basically closed uh, to the outside world and no foreign uh, businesses, uh, no, no modern sciences, and they were falling rapidly behind uh, the, not only Japan, uh, but Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, which were just beginning to take off at that time. The, the issue for Deng was that he realized that the system he grew up in was no longer viable, and he had to help find a new system. But he did not have the power of Mao in being able to decide just by himself. He had to find a way of appealing, or at least getting appealing to, or at least getting the support of, other people uh, on the Politburo, and therefore he had to be much more cautious than Mao in taking big steps like decollectivization, dealing with the legacy of Mao, uh, and uh, opening to the outside world. In all of these, Deng found a way to manage the political transition. I think what's great about Deng is not that he was the only one to think of opening or reform, uh, he's known for those, but those were really started by uh, Hua Guofeng before him, and they were started by many other cadres. I think what's great about Deng is that he was the political manager who knew how to handle that process. Uh, when he was dealing with decollectivization, he knew many people wanted to stay collectivized, and therefore he did not go out on a limb declaring it. He said, in starving areas uh, where people have no way of uh, getting enough to eat, they should be allowed to find their own ways uh, to uh, make, make a way to produce food. And so some of them resorted to family farming. Uh, and then Deng called in reporters. They reported on that for the next year or two. 
And of course, the areas where that had been tried and where family farming was tried were very successful. Uh, the word got around, and then Deng said, well, in those areas where they did have uh, such uh, difficult situations, that people should be allowed to choose their own way. And within a year or two, they were decollectivized without Deng going out on a limb. In handling the legacy of Mao, he never directly denounced Mao and always took the position of defending the greatness of Mao. But in a sense, he put Mao in the museum. Uh, his um, uh, picture was to hang at the Tiananmen Square, uh, whereas they would take a very detailed examination of some of the mistakes that, Deng, that Mao had made in later life. Uh, but uh, while uh, protesting uh, about all the, explaining all the wonderful things that Mao had done, he distanced himself and allowed the party to undertake a critique of the uh, recent party history, uh, which, show, uh, which concluded that Mao had indeed made serious errors uh, in the latter part of his life, but that Mao was still to be revered. That was a way of handling all the supporters for Mao uh, and yet distancing himself so that he could go his own way. Let me just mention five areas where I think that the path that Deng uh, began uh, really set the stage that still influences how things are done now. I believe that uh, he set the new pattern. It wasn't Mao, the Mao's pattern was not working. One is that he wanted a regularization instead of having uh, revolution, they were tearing down things, or they were fighting. He wanted to have regular meetings, party plenums every year, party congresses every five years, and people would have terms of office, and the old people should not serve for life, but retire. That was something that was not true in China historically. It was really only at, <clears throat> at the end of Deng's period that he had that program fully established. Secondly, he wanted a meritocracy. The class warfare meant that if you want to have examinations, you still had to give special uh, consideration for people who came from worker peasant backgrounds. And so you couldn't really use uh, merit, strict meritocratic standards. Deng felt that by 1978, the country was strong enough and they, there were no longer any uh, landlords and no longer any technicians uh, and no longer uh, 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 party bourgeois who were exploiting the peasants, and therefore they could have examinations strictly on merit and raise people on their merit. Third, he wanted leadership teams in uh, every local area, every uh, region, uh, province, county, uh, special district, uh, and in uh, major uh, cities in the country. And he wanted a, t a team, he found that uh, when he was fighting World War II, that when people were killed, he had to have others ready to take their place. And he didn't want one single person, he wanted a group of people. But he wanted to give them a lot of leeway in deciding uh, what could be done and to measure them on how much progress their area made. The good thing about it was it worked and it, people uh, uh, could grow very rapidly in their area to make, ad adapt to the situation. The bad thing, is it gave enough leeway that a lot of people put things in their own pocket on the way, and you had a program uh, that was led to uh, very serious corruption. Fourth, he wanted to join the world. He uh, told uh, Carter's uh, science advisor, Frank Press, in the summer of 1978, uh, that they wanted, as soon as they normalized, they wanted to start sending people to the United States, and he pressed him so much uh, that Frank Press called Carter in the middle of the night and as Carter explained to me when I interviewed him on this, he was awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, because Dung insisted that he wanted to start sending uh, people right away, and he kept sending them <laughs> all uh, ever after. Uh, and in uh, the economy also, he, every single way, he wanted to join the world and learn the best practices all around the world. And five, uh, he did not want to make enemies. He was very critical of the Soviet Union. He said that, that they spent too much on the military and exhausted themselves. And it was better not to make enemies of other countries, but to work with other countries uh, and to uh, keep military expenses way down so you can concentrate on civilian development. Well, there's been some change in the last uh, of these. 
uh, and all these issues are not, uh, will not endure forever. But I think all those five areas that Deng uh, set up still have a very important influence in shaping the China of today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That's a very hard act to follow. Uh, actually, the book is much more than a biography. It's really uh, a representation of a person in his time. And I think uh, it's very instructive about the whole uh, process and unfolding of reform, which has done as the central figure in that story. I think it also rightly concentrates on the last uh, period uh, of Dung's life, because I think had Dung passed away in the early or mid-70s, we'd have thought of him as a pretty pedestrian, dull uh, bureaucrat. And it was only in that later part of his life that he really showed the initiative and drive uh, to move uh, China forward. I was a student uh, at the time when uh, Mao died, the Gang of Four arrested, and uh, people were eagerly awaiting uh, Deng's return. And I remember a lot of the faculty in our university would always say, he's going to do two things when he comes back. Once, uh, one is that he's going to allow us to, to earn more money. And secondly, he will reunite families that were separated by the Cultural Revolution. So there's a lot of anticipation and expectation about what he might do when he uh, came back to power. And as Ezra's book shows, in many ways that did not uh, disappoint. However, my, I guess my role as a commentator on this is to raise some critical issues. And I want to raise three points uh, uh, for the discussion. The first is I think that perhaps Dong was rather more like Mao than it might appear at first blush. They were both products of the same generation. They were products of war. They were products uh, of intrigue within the party, between the party and outsiders. And they were products of continual betrayal. And I think that marked uh, both people. Like Mao, he was a master strategist. There's no doubt about that. He was a supreme insider politician, as Ezra's work shows very well. But he was also ruthless when necessary. And he could be just as ruthless as Mao. He dismissed uh, two of his successors, Hu Yaobang, Zhao Ziyang, who he'd originally handpicked uh, to replace uh, or to take over as general secretary. But when he felt uh, they'd moved out of line with policy or became a liability, he took no time uh, in removing them. He also shared, of course, the desire to make China strong. But I think, like Mao, he had little understanding of economics. And what he had was often a preference for rapid economic growth. And that, of course, uh, had tremendous uh, advantages for China. I think it saved the Communist Party in the early 90s, after the tragedy of 1989, I think the fact that uh, Deng went on his walkabout in southern China and told people just to unleash economic forces, I think saved the Communist Party. But at the same time, it set off a massive bout of inflation that it took technocrats, such as uh, Zhu Rongji, to come in and settle down within the economy. Similarly, in the late 80s, it was to a large extent Deng Xiaoping's decision to launch price reform and try and push rapidly ahead with reforms that led to a lot of the dissatisfaction and unrest that fed into 1989. Although, of course, Zhao Ziyang was the person who took the blame for that. So he did save the party, but it brought very high inflation, very high costs. The last point that I think he shared in common with Mao was that he had, I think even more strongly than Mao, the view of the primacy of the party for achieving one's objectives. And in that fact, I think he was probably more of a faithful Leninist than Mao himself was. So my second point, I think that belief in the party and the party as the vehicle for driving China forward, I think didn't blind him to, but made him very cautious about the necessity of significant political restructuring, let alone uh, major reforms. Now, early on in the 1980s, he flirted with the idea of considerable political reform. But because of his con overriding concern about stability, he tended to close down uh, those options. But I think Deng was probably the only leader who might have been able uh, to conduct a program 
of political reform that would have matched the spectacular economic successes. But what it has done, and I think Ezra touched on this in his closing comments, is it protected the privileged position of the party, which as we see now has raised many concerns and issues around inequality and corruption that is rife in contemporary China. Thirdly, as Ezra said, and I would stress this perhaps even a little bit more strongly than Ezra, that in some ways Deng Xiaoping was the figurehead for a collective leadership. He was a figurehead for the Chinese Communist Party when they needed it. He could represent that new dynamism. He could articulate that new approach. And he was very pithy and very earthy in the way he expected that. But to some extent, it was a collective leadership. And I think he also was, uh, as all great leaders, a man fit for his time. And as a result, he represented not just himself, his own views, but he represented a wave of societal pressure and other leaders who wanted uh, to bring about reform, uh, as Ezra said. We know in economic reforms, probably Chen Yun was more influential than Deng Xiaoping. He was not convinced about the necessity for moving back to household farming, whether it was a strategical um, move, as Ezra suggests, or whether he was generally unconvinced, I don't know. But it was very, very late that he gave his approval to that. Similarly, uh, it was society uh, that built the township and village enterprises that marked a lot of the dynamism through the 1980s. And in fact, in the middle of the 1980s, uh, Deng himself said, where did they come from? No one in the leadership thought about these township and village enterprises. The people did this by themselves. So like all great leaders, he was in the right place uh, at the right time. And that's in no way to detract from what is actually uh, a marvelous uh, biography of Deng. And uh, given the shortness of time, I'll leave my comments there. So the plan is for us to have a little conversation for 10 minutes or so uh, where I try to press uh, our uh, colleagues. And then we're going to have questions from the audience. We're the microphones here on the ground floor and on the lunch. <coughs> but uh, as you mentioned, uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And in the book, you say that of the leaders outside China, Lee Kuan Yew had the biggest impact on Deng Xiaoping and his thinking. And it was kind of a demonstration case that, Cheney, that modernization was not inconsistent with Chinese civilization. And uh, that all sounds exactly right to me. Is one tries to look from where we are now forward, that's not the subject of the book, but that's where I'm pressing you to go. You so the trend lines you see, you see continuing. Uh, if we try to figure out China the next 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, and we try to think about the relationship between China and the U.S. So this is obviously a subject Lee Kuan Yew follows pretty closely because he hasn't managed to navigate his small boat in the midst of this uh, environment uh, without being very sensitive to what goes on. And while he usually is pretty, or he's always very diplomatic, and he's always insightful, Ricky Lakes gives us an opportunity to see what he sometimes says, you know, more privately. So let me quote, and then I'm going to ask you to comment and then see what Tony says as well. So here's uh, uh, Lee. China is following an approach consistent with the ideas in the Chinese television series, The Rise of the Great Powers, something you have talked about. The mistake of Germany and Japan had been in efforts to challenge the existing order. Chinese are not stupid. They've avoided this mistake. China's economy has surpassed other countries, with the exception of Japan and the U.S. This is now back two years ago. They've not surpassed Japan. Uh -huh. uh, China won't reach the American level uh, Soon, but maybe in a decade or two. Okay. Uh, so he then says, China's military buildup delivers a strong message to the U.S. that China is serious about Taiwan. However, the Chinese do not want to clash with anybody, at least not for 15 to 20 years. The Chinese are confident, here's the thing, the Chinese are confident in 30 years 
Their military will essentially match in sophistication the US military. In the meantime, they do not see themselves disadvantaged in this fight. Close quote. So again, who can tell if trends continue for another 10 or 20 or 30 years? And who can tell where that leads us? But what do you say about Lee Kuan Yew's assessment, not only about the care that China has exercised in getting to this point, but about the possibility that as it becomes the number one economy, if it does, it might come to have a military that's approximately the size and sophistication of the U.S. military, and that that might lead to their different geopolitics. I think if Dung were alive today, he would keep down the military from getting quite so dominant. He would be very concerned about the issue of how you get stronger without getting too wide of this. Very sensitive to that issue. And he wanted Taiwan back. His uh, vision of Taiwan was that by getting more military force in America and reducing military aid, uh, Taiwan would see that the writing was on the wall and would make a deal. That's what he hoped. And I think what's happening now, the way I read it, is that the leader of uh, China, Hu Jintao, uh, uh, are trying to follow Dung's path. But there are already military people and there are already academics who think that China is now getting stronger, that America's financial weakness shows that China uh, will get stronger, that America cannot loan sustain the level of uh, military expenses that we now have, and that at a certain point they will be able to do more uh, to get uh, Taiwan back. And at that point, I hope to see that by uh, weapons, that Taiwan would make some kind of agreement to come back to China. I think that's... You think that's the plan, yeah? I think that's the plan. Tony, what would you... Uh, um, I just make two points. I think the first is that uh, the world has changed significantly over the last 10 to 15 years since Don was around. And I think not surprisingly, there's a certain triumphalism in China that has been extraordinarily successful with its economic growth, maintaining the economic growth over the last period of time. And that the global financial crisis has, for many in China, exposed what they think are fundamental flaws and weaknesses with the American model, which was much revered previously. So I think that has kind of pushed things forward for, in some areas, more nationalistic and more aggressive response, as Ezra says, amongst the military, but also the world within society. The second thing I would say though is whether they can or cannot challenge the US is of course impossible to answer. But I think the reality is that China has considerable problems over the next decade that are going to confront the leadership, which probably mean that continuing on the current course will be extremely difficult. Um, you know, we touched on the inequality, the corruption, but also, you know, there's the rise of a more wired, globalized middle class in the urban areas. Uh, there's the rise of social media and the impacts that has. So I think these are going to present significant challenges for the new leadership that might well destabilize the current political structures. And of course, China's progress all hinges on continued economic growth. And we do know that that will slow down over the next 10 to 15 years. But again, we don't really know what the consequence will be. So if I was America, I'd be looking at it, but I wouldn't particularly feel threatened. Let me get, uh, ask you to line up at the microphones uh, to ask a question if you're interested. And if nobody moves quickly, I will ask one. Let me start with the microphone. Lounge, please. And introduce yourself. And I'll make a question, please. My name is Elizabeth Nier. I'm a German journalist um, currently a fellow at the Center for European Studies. And yep. I have a question concerning um, China's single child policy, because you mentioned uh, quite a few times examples for the long perspective politics, um, China looking 10, 20, or even more years ahead. Uh, to me, it's quite clear that the single child policy is something that will 
affect China's future wealth, and we do not know whether will China get rich before it gets old. And so I've always wondered um, how much the, the collective committee actually knew about this perspective, how much they cared, how much they saw this happening or coming up, or I mean, was it just accepted as a fact which will only affect the people after them, or did they just not bother enough? Good question. In Mao's day, Mao thought that a country's strength depends on having a big population. And he didn't want birth control. He didn't want uh, restrictions on the population. So the China grew so rapidly that it didn't have enough grain to feed the population. So when Deng came to power in 1978, the person who was handling economics, Chen Yun, felt that they needed to have some kind of restraint on uh, population growth in order to be able to feed the population. He was the person who thought about economic plans and he tried to match the production with the needs of the population. And he could see the population was getting too big. And therefore, after 1978, they really began in earnest a, a program of uh, birth control. What China is large enough to have specialists and bureaucrats in all areas. Uh, when I was in uh, China several years ago, they had all the 46 heads, they, they had 46 heads of African states, and they had linguists to accompany all of them uh, to various meetings. That's not something, you know, every nation can pull off. Uh, the worst does it feel as long as they speak English. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be sure that in the case of growth control, that there were a lot of people who thought of a lot of different contingency and a lot of different needs. And I think the question is now, uh, they don't want the population to grow. They want and they see the urban population, the one child falls from their point of view working quite well, keeping down population. Uh, the problem is that they don't have too many old people and not enough young people. So what do you do at that point? The same problem that uh, Europe and uh, Japan uh, and uh, perhaps even the United States are facing uh, with a, a smaller percentage of the population working. And they've thought about that, and they've thought about providing other incentives rather than strict uh, um, administrative, authoritative, uh, uh, punitive approach to birth control. Uh, but at the moment, at least, uh, they're following the same birth control. Tony, you've actually had conversations with them about the policy and the alternatives. So please give us a picture here. Yeah. Well, maybe just make three quick comments. The first is that actually it was Mao who shifted the ideas of the kind of planning. I think it would be very difficult without his shift to an idea that said the population growth needed to be curtailed. But it was much more of a policy in the early 1970s, which is, as rightly says, the strength of the company end of the uh, 1970s. The other issue, in addition to the age group, is the skewed male-female ratio, uh, ratios, which are going to produce something like 40 to 50 million unmarried males in China over the next 10 to 15 years. And that has to be a worrying trend uh, for policymakers. What they're trying to do now, as Ezra said, is to release the policy gradually. So if you're from a single child family now, and you marry someone from a single child, you now can have two children. And the policy has always been more relaxed in the rural areas and what we refer to as ethnic minority areas. So the problems are well understood, but you know, demographics take a long time to work their way through, and they're struggling with this problem. And the last and third thing I would say is that you created a massive bureaucracy of the State Family Planning Commission which goes all the way down to the villages, and they don't want to lose their jobs. <laughs> and they argue very strongly that China has to keep this in place. It's necessary for a whole range of reasons. Okay. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Yes. My name is Thomas Bell, and I'm one of the here at the Public Policy. Um, I am wondering about a certain uh, paradox at the heart of China's rise, and that is the very rapid development uh, and progress on the economic front, and almost uh, very little, if at all, um, movement on the political front. 
And I'm just wondering uh, if you could uh, state for us what your opinion is, whether this is sustainable in the long run. And I would ask this, this question and I'll double it up with uh, the CSAT. I'm an Eastern European, so in the, uh, after 1989, um, we all, or the, there was a lot of talk in, in the foreign policy circles that the same would eventually happen to China or that within a few years it would be inevitable that uh, some sort of political reform also happens in China. And of course, here we are 20 years later, how long we were. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and um, just uh, give us an idea of what your particular take is, where the tipping point might be in the future, if there is such a thing. Good. The first point I would make is that there has been a lot of political change. Uh, Tony was in China before I was. The first time I was there was 1973. So when I was there, when I walked on the street, a lot of people were afraid to talk to me. And I would stop and actually one can sense the fear. I was not allowed to visit schools. I was not allowed to uh, go to companies. Uh, they were all off limits. And people were frightened to talk. The bookstores had the little red book, a few books by Mal, and some high school technology books. And that was about it. There has been an explosion of books available uh, in Chinese and in native foreign languages. Uh, there has been a, a growth in the independence of enterprises of uh, leaders of government. There has been a great growth in uh, the opportunity to speak out. So there has been a great deal of political change. Dunn's view was how much political uh, change depends on the situation in the country. If the country had uh, greater freedom and tolerance and public support, they could move to advance democracy. In 1978, he allowed the democracy wall, people to write on the wall for several months. In the end, he closed it down because he felt that China was still so chaotic, had so many poor people, that it could not keep order if they continued to allow it. And uh, in 1980, he made a, a very important speech in encouraging political reform. In 1986, he allowed Zhao Ziyang to have broad consideration of political reform. But in the end, he felt that after observing what happened in Eastern Europe, that that was dangerous for what might happen in China. And they felt, uh, not just them, but many other leaders also, that to keep political order, and to keep stability and rapid growth, they had to clamp down uh, much more than they clamped down in Eastern Europe. And in the end, he and John Zeman and many others felt that they made the right decision. That if they saw what happened in the Soviet Union, uh, they fell apart in many Eastern European countries. They felt that by keeping order and more rapid growth, it was a great benefit to society. I know we, most Americans, would strongly disagree with that judgment. But I feel it's my responsibility to explain how they look at it. Yeah, I mean, I think two things with the German policy. Uh, one is, as Ezra said in his opening remarks, is the regularization of uh, regime practices. So there's a degree of predictability to things. And that has certainly been revived, and that has entailed uh, political reforms. The second is, Liberalization, but liberalization is a substitute for democratization. And again, as Ezra was just describing, significant liberalization of regime practice. Um, the question is, yeah, is it enough moving forward? Well, one big difference, of course, with Eastern Europe, you were dealing with stagnant economies, which were very heavily state dominated. I mean, a lot of what's kept China going is a tremendous growth, and the fact that for the new middle class, they've been able to buy in to this process moving forward. So there isn't an alienation, there isn't a disillusionment. Can it hold going forward? Well, my personal view is no. But if you ask me when, whether that's 40 years, whether it's 10 years, whether it's 15 years, I don't have a clue. But I think what history tells, tells us is if you do not develop the kind of representative institutions that enhance transparency and accountability, sooner or later, 
the economy gets frustrated and people get frustrated and it builds up more pressure to change. But when that happens, who knows? This gentleman, please. Yes. I am Sophia Alar. I am from uh, a program, Harvard Kennedy School. I would like to ask you about the paradox of Dong. In one side, I do agree that uh, the key success of uh, Dang is because uh, he maintaining economic reform first, not in uh, uh, politics. And the problem lies in the fact that uh, he, uh, according to uh, New York Times magazine, New York Times, that, uh, you know, uh, he implemented what he called as socialist market economy. That's the first point. On the other side, we see the reality that he also uh, believed in democracy because uh, when he met an uh, American businessman, he mentioned like this, democracy has to be institutionalized and written into law. The paradox is that it was Deng who agreed to press pro-democracy activists and the ten unknown tragedy. What factors causing this kind of decision? Thank you. entrepreneurial leadership at the Harvard Extension. I'm very interested in Deng Xiaoping and his ability to rise in the ranks. How does one become the leader of this complex Chinese system? Great question. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, and uh, by being very bold in uh, pushing the party. And it was a civil war period also. Dunn grows by being a military soldier uh, and by uh, fighting in, in the service uh, and by performing well, following orders, and, and uh, by making achievements in, in the revolution. So it's a very different era uh, after the time and period of the revolution. Tony, I'm going to get you to comment on the same question, but also then give me the other my question, which is an extended to currently, because you run the programs that are actually training lots of the people who are part of this succession uh, uh, process as they prove themselves at level after level in the executive programs here at the school. Yeah, it's a fascinating question. And as Ezra said, there's a very fine balance between being innovative but not being seen as uh, too much of a risk taker. You know, you, you don't get all the way to the top necessarily by doing nothing. But if you do too much, you're likely to get your head chopped off as well. So there is a lot of local experimentation that takes place. And of course, we're seeing this covered in the press at the moment with people talking about different models of development, you know, the, the recreation of a Maoist cult in the southwest of China in the city of Chongqing uh, against what people see perhaps as a more market-oriented liberal model in Guangdong. So you are getting more of people beginning to push their different agendas. Um, but it is, it, it's a very fine line, and we don't have enough time for you to talk about it in detail. But coming to Graham's question, I mean, I think the current generations of leaders are extraordinarily smart. And they know just as well as we do and better what the problems are in their country. I mean, there's nothing we could say to them that they didn't already know was a problem or was an issue. Um, you know, most of them now, you know, certainly have master's degrees, often have PhD degrees. But I still sense that, and so they are looking uh, for new ideas to experiment with. Well, within a contained environment, administrative changes, administrative uh, reforms. But I do also sense from a number of them that they do feel things are beginning to move quicker and quicker and quicker. And whether they can keep adapting and innovating quickly enough to keep up with that. I sometimes use the analogy of a ball bouncing down a hill. You know, they've got control of the ball at the top, but slowly is bouncing faster and faster. No one's in panic. But everybody knows things have got to change, and no one quite knows how. But they're a very, very smart bunch. And depending on which time of day you catch me, I'm very pessimistic or very optimistic okay. about where that's going to go. Okay. Well, I think uh, what an extraordinary opportunity. You have an even better opportunity. Uh, Ezra's book, uh, A Great Night. Uh, let me also remind you that if you just sit in your seat for the next four days, there's more things coming. So I'm going to just give you a preview of coming attraction because Marina organizes such an amazing group of programs. So tomorrow night at 6 p.m. here will be Bob Zellick. Bob is a graduate of the county school who's gone on to be a special trade representative at the time. China came on to the WTO. He was then the Deputy Secretary of State in charge of China, among his other accounts, and he's now the president of the World Bank. So he's a great example of what we would like to see people grow up to be at, uh, at the Kennedy School. On Wednesday night, same time, same place, 6 o'clock, uh, there's going to be news on the front line, Occupy Wall Street, flash mobs, and gun violence. God help us, okay. And Trent Wilson, we have the mayor of Baltimore and the mayor of Philadelphia talking about problems they're dealing with tonight. Mm -hmm. And then on Thursday night, there's a terrific panel on the challenge of growing inequality, not looking at China, but looking at the USA. So for tonight, for Ezra, and for Tony, let's say thank you very much.
put you off the dinner with them.